All right. So so let, let's start out with, with Rebecca Boudreau. Rebecca is president and CEO of Oberon Fuels. And, and Rebecca, I'd, I'd like you to tell just a little bit about Oberon Fuels and why you believe that the blending with dimethyl ether, DME from renewable, renewable sources, uh, holds promise for our community. Yes, well, thank you for the introduction, Sinj, and the opportunity to be here. Uh, so uh, I am based in uh, sunny Southern California, and our company for the past 10 years has focused on the conversion of waste streams to the molecule DME. So we like to refer to DME, or dimethyl ether, as a propane's cousin, right? So there's some similarities, but there's some differences. And so uh, I, of course, had to bring my molecules, like Eric, I'm a chemist by training, so those of you who are familiar with propane, we've got our propane, carbon, and three black circles are carbon, the rest is hydrogen, and then meet its cousin, uh, DME. So the only difference is in the center. Uh, so the center here is oxygen instead of carbon and two hydrogens. Um, and so there are similarities in how they're handled, their solubility parameters, which is why we think this is a great uh, molecules to blend. Um, but then they're made from different feedstocks, so taking advantage of as Eric talked about, the different routes to having incorporating renewable into the propane industry, uh, you have multiple routes to achieve carbon neutrality. Uh, so it's exciting to hear about the work and others will talk about what's been going on with renewable propane uh, with uh, DME, which can be made from renewable sources such as animal waste, wastewater treatment gas, uh, landfill gas. Uh, there, uh, we, you can blend up to 20% uh, DME into propane without any infrastructure changes. And so one of the, the powerful things we can dig into this a little later is, so when you make DME from, let's say, cow manure, which there's a lot of in California, uh, dairy manure, uh, CARP estimates the carbon intensity of DME to be minus 278. So even if you're only replacing about 20% of DME or propane with DME, you're getting drastic reductions in carbon intensity. So I think it's a very powerful opportunity for these molecules, whether using propane, propane and renewable propane, renewable propane and renewable DME, these, there's multiple pathways to carbon neutrality for the industry and an opportunity to get at significant carbon reductions. Wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, next up, I will introduce Curtis Powers. Curtis is the Manager of Compliance for REG, Renewable Energy Group. And, and Curtis, um, you know, REG was one of the first movers on renewable propane in the market. And, and why did REG choose to, you know, make a move and enter the market with renewable propane? Ah, yeah, so uh, good question. I, uh, I've actually asked folks internally because it was actually um, it was actually a plant that was designed and developed before REG acquired it. Um, it was Dynamic Fuels, um, which REG acquired in 2014. Um, and based on some talks with engineers, um, I actually don't have a, a great idea. Um, I think it's primarily just because that's how most refineries are developed is you have a diesel cut a naphtha cut um, and a propane cut. Um, so I think that's that's primarily why. But um, but I I also think that there were folks there who at the beginning realized that having a multitude of products coming out of um, a biorefinery was going to be valuable in the future, even at the, even if it wasn't at the time. And so they designed it accordingly. Excellent. Thanks, Curtis. And and the last panelist to add to the group here is is Brian Shervikal with World Energy. And Brian, uh, you all started you started your journey with renewable energy back in 2009 with sustainable aviation fuel. Um, what opportunities do you see for World Energy with renewable propane? Um, first of all, thank you everybody uh, for joining today. Um, I'm Brian Shervikal, Chief Commercial Officer of World Energy. Um, I do uh, want to take just one second. Um, uh, Eric Johnson walked through a little bit of the, the different pathways, including um, hydro treating, which is what we utilize. Um, I just want to point out uh, a couple of minor things, and hopefully we can get some adjustments to some of those initial slides uh, from Eric with regard to what we've done uh, in, in California. So um, World Energy um, in 2018 
um, uh, purchased Altair Fuels, which was the original developer, uh, the company I started back in 2009. But World Energy itself has been in the uh, low carbon fuel industry for uh, a little over 20 years. So we've got uh, a great experience uh, within our team and uh, in, in many different solutions with regards to, to low carbon fuels. Um, so just briefly, um, today we actually are producing uh, through our process um, LPG. However, uh, when we did our initial implementation, because of the scale, we did not put in the uh, technology required to be able to pull that propane out and utilize it in, in higher, better uses. So today it's essentially going in to help create the power to run our facility. Um, we are uh, in the process of uh, a slightly greater than billion dollar investment to continue to convert the balance of that facility um, to uh, fully renewable. Um, and so, uh, Eric, um, when you were talking about the opportunities for others to do conversions, we're excited to have shown the path. And we did take a uh, nearly 100 year old um, uh, traditional oil and gas refinery, uh, principally an asphalt facility, and have done the conversion. Today, we're producing only renewable fuels there, um, and we're, we're fully optimizing the capability of that, of that site over the next couple of years. Um, and, and so as we increase our capability and over the next two years make these investments, we will put in the, the uh, equipment to be able to pull that propane out. And so as we look at um, our relationships with our customers, our corporates, um, we look to, to, to fully understand their complete decarbonization requirements. And, and quite frankly, they're, they're, they're diverse in most cases. So we might start with something uh, like, like providing sustainable aviation fuel or a renewable diesel. But as we get into those relationships, we see that they have a multitude of different supply chain needs with folks uh, uh, like Amazon, one of our newest customers. And there might be implications uh, uh, for the use of a propane that hadn't been there. So we're excited about over the next couple of years, bringing those to commercialization within California. And we're excited about having that as another arrow in the quiver, if you will, in finding the best way for our customers to decarbonize. Excellent, excellent. So, um, maybe if you could kind of expand on that just a little bit as well. You know, obviously, as a as a plant comes online, whether that's that's a converted plant, a new plant, there there is there is a decision to be made. You know, am I going to if we're going to talk about renewable propane, am I going to, you know, capture that renewable propane and deal with it, or how will I use it? Could you talk to us a little bit about you know how you see a, what drives that decision, and, and perhaps what's what's the milestones when that decision has to be made? You know, are there key points in that you know in that decision making process where we, as a propane industry, need to be aware that that plants have a choice to make and how we can influence that choice? Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to just you know payback periods, return on investment, um, because. Uh, if you don't have, you know, the bullets in place or the different piping and things like that in place, um, you got to figure out how much, you know, money that's going to cost on CapEx and then, you know, OpEx as well, as well as then having, um, I think for this audience in terms of like what can people do downstream is that, you know, if there's a market signal generally from customers or, or other, you know, or potential customers that there is a market for this, um, that helps drive the decision. Um, Obviously, it's more than just capex and and things like that because there's a, you know, in the, you know, renewable and low carbon fuel space, there's a lot of regulatory work, um, which that's that's a lot of what I do, you know, trying to make sure you know you get registered for the different programs like the RFS, the LCFS, etc. And um, and so that also plays into it because there is a cost, um, even if it's just time to getting all that done, and and it can be uh, there can be a lot to that as well. So uh, I think there's a lot. To consider but it's it's not just capex and, and things like that but it's also regulatory and, and compliance as well excellent okay um rebecca we'll move to you next and uh, you know i know from from working with you over over the past year you know obviously oberon has done a lot of work on on that front as well looking at lcfs and, and capex and all of that and, and you see Places where where renewable propane and real, renewable DME can move down that pathway, uh, you know, almost hand in hand, I guess. Could you could you expand a little bit on that, on how how the two renewable fuels can can complement and and work together to achieve that same end game of providing clean energy into the market? 
Yes, uh, so it's a really exciting time for renewable fuels because you're, uh, as Eric touched on and Brian is demonstrating with his work, as well as Curtis, you, you have uh, traditional refinery infrastructure that's now being leveraged to make renewable fuels. And while sometimes there's, you know, this molecule here, this molecule here, you're starting to see the crossover and the blending of how we can all work together to re achieve these carbon neutrality goals. Um, and so when I think about uh, DME and renewable propane, how these could work together, just to give you a sense, um, I touched on under California's low carbon fuel standard, uh, the state is required to reduce the carbon intensity of the fuel supply by 20% by 2030. And so traditional propane will be too carbon intense uh, prior to that deadline. So the industry is doing a great job. Those people who are, many of whom are on this webinar today, of introducing renewable propane, reducing uh, the carbon intensity of the fuel supply. Uh, and so how DME can enter into this equation is because DME is so carbon negative, uh, you can use a small amount of it and get drastic carbon reduction. So to give you examples, so it's generally accepted. So DME and propane have been blended for over 30 years around the world, uh, primarily in Asia, used as cooking and heating fuel. Uh, however, only a limited amount of work has been done in blending DME and propane for transportation applications. So it's generally accepted you can blend about 20% DME into propane without any material compatibility issues. Over that, DME is an excellent solvent, so you have to, it'll dissolve the rubber components, so you have to change them out. However, but at 20% around that area, you, it's miscible and you can leverage your existing infrastructure. So you start to think about um, uh, DME as a way to even really expand the availability of renewable propane. Uh, so there's cases where uh, you could put in, so if you had traditional propane with a carbon intensity of 83, uh, DME made from cow manure, dairy manure, carbon intensity of minus 278. We believe with early testing that we're doing with Roush Clean Tech, SHV Energy, and PERC, that we believe about 16 volume percent for transportation applications is about the right amount of DME to blend in with propane. And so with just 16 volume percent, the carbon intensity of that DME is minus 278. You go from a CI of 83 all the way down to 35. And then as you can continue to add a little bit more, you may be able to get a few more volume percent from there. You can continue to re reduce the carbon uh, score. And that's really based on the octane level is the limiting factor there. So then you think about, okay, now you blend renewable propane and renewable DME, and you're getting them closer and closer to carbon neutrality. So I think it's a very exciting um, opportunity and a great example of how these different molecules can work together. They have di different attributes and bring different things to the table, but can work together to a common goal of carbon neutrality. Excellent. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'll jump back to Brian now. Um, and, and actually, I'll probably use this, this same question with everybody on the panel here. But, you know, as you look at the marketplace, we talk a lot about transportation. Um, you know, I think a lot of times we think on road, but we've mentioned off road transportation as well, um, particularly forklifts. Um, what, what challenges do you see in the current marketplace for for you know, implementing and growing the use of renewable propane and, and renewable DME in the transportation sector? Well, I think that it's it's still very much a nascent industry. So it's 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 as much as anything as we um, forge forward with new technologies and new possibilities. It's about um, finding opportunities to demonstrate to wider audiences the art of the possible. And so um, folks can understand what is out there and what solutions they can deploy. I think it's, as, as uh, we've seen in California, in particular with the low carbon fuel standard program, it's all about uh, reducing carbon intensity. Um, uh, and I, ideally also, uh, the, you know, the criteria emissions that, that are created by ut utilizing these fuels. So I think that, um, you know, for us, again, it's demonstrating the fact that we're going to be able to put commercial volumes into play um, into the marketplace and, and working with um, those folks, uh, those companies that are looking to lean into change and decarbonize their activity. Um, I want to point out that um, part of that art of the possible, and Rebecca was talking about it just now, again, is helping to, to, to reduce the carbon intensity so that when these companies look at the options they have, 
that um, solutions uh, like like propane, renewable propane, will be exciting to them. Um, I will say that today uh, we've been able to demonstrate in our most recent pathways uh, carbon intensities of just over 20, um, and um, that's that's you know publicly available within CARB, and um, we're on a, a trajectory um, both through the conversion, which brings some efficiencies within the calculations of carbon intensity, but also through deployment of additional technologies. Uh, we believe that um, by the time our, our conversion comes on, we'll actually be at zero or less than zero carbon intensity for our, our fuels. And the, reason, the way we get there is by utilizing other, other low carbon products like renewable natural gas. Hydrogen is one of the largest contributors uh, to our carbon intensity scoring. And so we're now accessing renewable natural gas and that'll get us down to single digits and we have other things that we're working on to get us to, to, to zero or less than zero. And we think that that becomes extremely compelling. So putting commercial volumes uh, out as a possibility to the marketplace, offering something that's uh, uh, near zero or less than zero carbon intensity, I think will start to break barriers and, and create inroads into, into the use of these products. Excellent, thank you. Um, Curtis, I'll come back to you and, and kind of a similar question. What what are the opportunities that REG sees with, with renewable propane? And what, I guess, what are the things that you would like to see happen to help REG continue down that path and perhaps produce even more? Whether that's regulatory, industry support, whatever that may be, what are the, what's the, where can you use assistance to overcome any of those challenges? I mean, I think I think the biggest thing for us, um, or at least because I'm a regulatory guy, right, is that, you know, the low carbon fuel standard, we have regulatory certainty out to 2030. Um, and so you have like, you know, an overall trajectory because, um, I mean, we, REG, like World Energy, I mean, we do biodiesel and renewable diesel. And if you've been in that, you know, industry for a while, you know that, you know, we have a federal tax credit. It's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. Uh, we have a renewable fuel standard, which we might have an RVO, we might not, um, depending on the politics and things like that. And so, and so when I look at renewable propane, it kind of reminds me, like I wasn't in the industry uh, 10 plus years ago. I've only been with REG seven and a half years now. But um, I mean, I can tell you that even within the last seven and a half years, like the amount, the role of regulatory certainty is a big, uh, it's a big help in terms of, okay, now I can see, okay, we can kind of model things out and say, okay, we have the certainty, you know, we think the return is is here um, and, and conduct business accordingly. And so having that, um, I think is um, with the LCFS and other programs that are, are like that, um, just helps, helps people and businesses make decisions um, and plan accordingly. Excellent, thank, thank you, Curtis. Um, Eric, I've left you alone for a little while so you could catch your breath from the, from the presentation, but I'm going to come back to you. Um, you know, you, you obviously, based, based in Switzerland, you do a lot of work with, with the World LP Gas Association. And I'm kind of wondering what, uh, what, what do you think the U.S. industry can, you, can learn from, from the World LP Gas Association and the World LPG industry in, in, as it relates to renewable propane and renewable propane production? I, well, in, in the in, in on the HVO side of things, um, I think the U.S. is really right up there with Europe in, in many ways. And in fact, um, California has probably gone on farther in some respects. And what Curtis was just saying is just so true. I mean, the problem is they they do that here all the time. They're constantly changing, moving the goalposts, as we say. And so it makes it very difficult to know what you're supposed to do and whether you should invest in this and that and the other thing. And, and in fact, some, somewhere where, where California is ahead is, is on setting some of these pathways. What we're looking for from the Renewable Energy Directive, it, uh, the, the second version of it, which has already gone through, but it's being revised again already, is to get a bunch of defaults ready that so when people come out with the product, they can know what the, what the carbon intensity ought to be or should be or default, or, you know, whatever it is. So in that way, they've, re they've really gone on ahead. I think probably the biggest difference, well, and it's not even a huge difference. I think what you're seeing to some extent, um, the idea of pursuing these other pathways that I talked about, you know, these seven other pathways, to some extent, there's probably more support uh, uh, among European governments in, in pushing that along. But again, I, I wouldn't even say that's a blanket thing. I, I think there's a perception sometimes that Europe moves more quickly on these things 
Um, I, actually, the more I look at it, they, they don't really. It's, they probably talk about it a bit more, uh, but I think the US actually has gotten on with, with uh, decarbonization and, and, and the shift to renewables in a very big way. Okay, thank you. Um, Rebecca, we'll come, come back to you again. And, and you know, what, g give us a little bit of insight on where you are in, in coming online to pr bring renewable DME, or, or as you told me uh, the other day, DME from renewable sources uh, to market. <laughs> yeah, so, so DME, so uh, those of you who've uh, been in the LPG propane industry for a while are familiar with DME because it has been produced for decades uh, around the world. Uh, and on the renewable side, uh, Kimrec is a leader uh, producing it in Sweden. There's a demonstration, a multi-year demonstration around the 2008 timeframe, the bio DME project in Europe. So uh, work has been done. The challenge has really been on the market opportunity for DME. And so um, our, our team at Oberon for the past, tomorrow is our 10th birthday, for the past 10 years have focused on both the technology side, but also in the market development and the regulatory framework. Uh, so on the technology, the production side, our uh, plant in Southern California is being upgraded to demonstration scale right now. Uh, this is through a $2.9 million grant from the California Energy Commission. This is actually the first public funding we ever received in our history. Um, that was announced in 2019. So construction starts in 30 days. Uh, for those modifications with DME production coming back online um, in early 2021. Uh, that DME produced will be used uh, with in propane blending for on-road vehicle demonstrations and looking uh, even beyond that as we scale up and bring that production online. Um, and, you know, as we think about, okay, volumes, how there's so much propane usage, how are we going to really drive volumes? Uh, while what we are, we're doing uh, is proving our technology in the market. There are others that Eric mentioned that are really teed up uh, to bring more DME production online in Europe and beyond. Interchem has done excellent work looking at municipal solid waste, Chemrec, and there's others as we prove the market. Uh, so there's really the, the path for DME is being laid out. It is being supported by the state of California. DME legislation was signed by Governor Newsom uh, the day after he announced his executive order banning internal combustion engine sales, new sales in 2035, to release a climate change package of bills, DME legislation was part of it to give DME taxation parity with other alternative fuels like uh, propane, LNG, and CNG, and saw it as part of the climate change solutions. So I think it's a very powerful time on the technology production front moving forward. Uh, the regulatory framework uh, that we've been developing for over a decade is now uh, coming into place. And then also the market opportunity by partnering with the propane industry, but also DME is an excellent hydrogen carrier. So we're doing work also empowering zero emission mobility going forward. Okay, thank you. Brian, back to you, kind of similar question. What's what's next from World Energy? What, what's, what's the next thing we'll hear out of you all as it relates to renewable propane? Well, I actually want to take a, an opportunity to, to put a message out, which I think is very encouraging. And, and um, Eric mentioned several different pathways, HBO being one and certain limitations. But I want to point out that a couple of things, um, some of those pathways and what we're doing with, with uh, the REGs doing within their uh, HVO plant and, and ours, um, they're not mutually exclusive paths entirely. So. Um, one important point is with what we're doing today feedstock wise, which is primarily fats, oils and greases, uh, triglycerides, when you break the backbone to get at the longer chains, your passes. So that's inherent. We're going to continue to make this product. So it's all about what's the highest, best use of that propane molecule. And we've got options. We can go into transportation. Uh, in our instance, we could put it into the, uh, the steam methane reformer for production of hydrogen. We're going to find out what the best path is. So again, we need to figure out what policy um, is, in, is uh, incentivizing what particular use or what this is telling us. On that, on that policy point, I just want to say, as we think about uh, talking to, to about the possibilities of uh, renewable propane, uh, it's important to emphasize to them that policies like the low carbon fuel standards work well versus some other policies because they, they, they don't pick winners and choosers. It's really about focusing on low carbon intensity and not incentivizing one product versus another. And that's a really critical message. Um, so just to, to pick up on that other point about not being mutually exclusive, 
Um, I'll give you an example. Um, whether it's um, uh, Fisher Tropes process that's going to produce uh, products uh, or a synthetic crude oil or a green crude oil from, um, in Fulcrum's case, municipal solid waste or the Velocis pathways um, utilizing woody biomass, those create a synthetic crude oil that still have to go through a hydroprocessing step. So those could be future feedstocks to go into uh, Curtis's plant at REG or our plant as an example. They're not mutually exclusive. So whether we continue on fats, oils, and greases where inherently you've got that propane, the propane that gets released or you have these future feedstocks that are gonna open up the front end of the plant, we think that we're gonna be an integral part and be producing more propane in the future. Wonderful, thank you, Brian. And, and Curtis, um, kind of a slight, and, and Joy hasn't jumped on to stop us yet. So we're, get, we're gonna keep rolling, even though we're at the top of the hour. Um, so Curtis, ne next question for you. Um, okay, so, you, so you're producing renewable propane and, and it's, it's going out and getting distributed. What, what are the considerations for uh, those, I guess, on the, on the receiving end of that renewable propane? How, how to take advantage of, of you know, the, the credits that go along with that and what are the, the things to consider as far as where it goes, how it's blended, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think one, one way, so we, we come from a biodiesel and renewable diesel background and relatively speaking on renewable fuel, low carbon fuel regs, um, relatively straightforward for those fuels, but renewable propane, um, like some other alternative fuels like renewable natural gas and things, um, it has extra, extra regulatory requirements. So there's things like affidavits, there's, you know, you know, fuel supply equipment registration stuff. And, um, and so I think, I think just for folks who um, may be downstream is just to be aware that, you know, if you're, if you're used to just, you know, we buy propane, we sell propane, it's not quite that simple for renewable propane. There's there's extra regulatory rules to make sure that, you know, if we're generating RINs and LCFS credits, that it is going into a transportation fuel end use, um, just to make sure that we keep the credits valid. And and there's a lot of paperwork and other things involved um, with that. And so I, I think as uh, if you're used to just we just buy and sell fuel, it's uh, just be aware that it's it's more complicated than that for uh, for renewable propane. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, you know, again, we've Thank talked you, a lot Sims. about. It looks like uh, maybe we have okay. time for one more question and opening it up, and then uh, it looks like our, our keynote has arrived. Okay, so so last question, uh, kind of for everybody. Um, you know, we, we we've talked about transportation. What 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 are the the other markets you'd like to see for renewable propane or renewable DME outside of transportation, and and what are the 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 roadblocks to to going you know to moving renewable fuels into those other other markets? What what are the roadblocks or perhaps what are the incentives that are not there? Eric, were you yeah, raising your I hand? Just very, very quickly to that, I would say yeah. that um, heating is you know heating both uh, residential and commercial but also industrial heating would be to me the most logical jump just because that's a big market for propane LPG already. Um, I think the big hurdles to it is that for the biggest hurdle that I see immediately is that the kind of regulatory setup that already exists with say LCFS and so on and, and similar systems in Europe is that does not exist for heating yet, at least it doesn't exist that I've seen of. And so you really do need those rules or otherwise it's really quite difficult for you. You can't get people to really do anything unless you get those rules. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, anything to add to that? Yeah, as I look at, uh, when I think about DME and its applicability, uh, I think of uh, transportation and the blending with propane, but also in other markets, still transportation, but using the molecule in different ways. Uh, so DME is an excellent diesel replacement. So there's opportunity, heavy duty trucking, off-road, heavy equipment for mining and other applications. And Ford is a leader in this space around the world. F F FPT, which is a Fiat powertrain. There, a case New Holland is doing work in that space. And also I see opportunities I mentioned earlier in DME as a hydrogen carrier. Uh, so back to the DME molecule, transporting as DME because it handles like propane, easy to handle and stripping off the hydrogen at the fueling stations. Uh, DME is known to be non-toxic as an aerosol propellant being used for 30 years. So I see this as an opportunity. And again, talking about synergies, the propane industry is set up to handle 
molecules like DME because of the similar properties, no matter if it's being blended with propane or it's being used as a hydrogen carrier or a diesel replacement. The, the propane infrastructure can be leveraged even beyond uh, the molecule that is moving today. So I think that's an exciting opportunity of going forward. Curtis, anything to add? Yeah, I think the point about Eric about transportation is all the incentives are pretty much for transportation and anything outside of that, there really are no incentives, um, at least how I read the rules today. And so it's really hard to justify investment for other end uses if you're losing, you know, a dollar a gallon or more uh, potentially. And so I think that, I don't, and I, regulatorily, I don't know exactly how you would do that if you make make it more of an opt-in for other end uses like heating oil or even for, you know, electrifying houses. Um, I don't really know because there's all sorts of challenges to avoid double counting and and things like that. But I, I think that is a point to note is that currently the incentives are just really for transportation, which make it hard to grow potentially the market as the market matures. Thank you. And Brian, any any, any last words of wisdom before we uh, call call this excellent panel uh, quits? Yeah, a couple thoughts. One particular, um, the opportunity for renewable pro pro propane is equal to the size of the entire propane market today at a minimum. Because if you're a buyer, and we'll talk about costs in a second, but if you're a buyer and you're cost indifferent, you're not going to choose the, the, the high carbon version versus the low carbon version. You're always going to pick low carbon. The point, point there is, is our propane is the same spec, same quality performance, et cetera. The difference being uh, going to be a low carbon alternative. Um, building on Curtis's point, you know, there are policies that are in place that have chosen certain applications uh, for the use of propane that now have better incentive in terms of monetizing the value of carbon to help drive down the cost than others. So it's about driving policy into, you know, additional uses. So as you think about the, the applications for propane today, you need to think about uh, how do you drive policy to those areas that are beyond just transportation. Um, so uh, it's a big wide open market and, it, and the biggest message here is how do we get uh, to Curtis's earlier point, long lived policy so we can rely upon it, deploy capital and, and, and be confident that we can get a return of and on that capital and, uh, and just expand the market to other product types. Thank you, Brian, and thank you everyone. Um, really appreciate your input. And uh, with that, Joy, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, everybody.